All right. Okay. Sam, Am I good to go? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it okay. helps if you're able to hear me. Yes. That's the. Okay. I believe. I believe everyone can hear me now, even the at home viewer. All right. So, like I said, a little bit of background about the Riyadh non excavation staff, Riyadh non last. Somebody needs to mute their mic. <laughs> but um, uh, 1960, 68, 69, Indiana University did first excavations there. Then from 74 to 79, Michigan State did a number of excavations. And there was a big gap between that. So, you know, after the 1979 work was done, not a whole lot was gone. It went on at, at Viad, not until, you know, 2009, when we started to pick up the ball and start working at the site again. Um, I got involved with, with Vyadnan, um, uh, just almost by mistake, really. I was working at uh, IPFW in Fort Wayne at the time, and we had a contract to do some, some work at Kathipikinuk site. Uh, it's it's uh, in uh, Prophetstown State Park, um, and that was my first fur trade site that I'd worked on, and I started getting interested in the whole thing, and, you know, kind of got, got into it. And so um, back in, uh, a few years later in 2009, we said, okay, let's see if we can do some uh, work at, at Fort Biotinon, the Big Daddy, right, over in, uh, in, in Tippecanoe County. So we got permission to do work there in 2009. We came back in 2013. We did a, a field school excavation that year. And then we came back in 2016 and 17 and did some more work there. And then there was a little bit of a gap and now we're back again in 2022. We were supposed to be here in 2020, but the pandemic, you know, kind of put a, a damper on that, you know, field work for a couple of years there. Um, so a lot of the work that we've done over the years is not excavation, really. Uh, only in 2013 were we actually breaking ground at Fort Biadnan. Most of what we were doing out there was magnetometry, which is um, uh, an instrument that detects uh, subsurface variations in the magnetic properties of the soil, right? So it's basically an instrument. You walk, it, the one that we have at USI kind of looks like this one here. It's made in uh, uh, England by a company called Bardington. And basically what you do is you just walk back and forth and back and forth with this thing over, you know, huge areas and over many weeks even, uh, collecting data about what's beneath the soil uh, in terms of the magnetics of the soil. So people do things, they dig holes, they burn things, they do this and that, and they change the magnetic properties of the soil, right? Um, so, uh, like I said, a lot of what the work we had done was involving magnetometry. So this is the instrument we have, uh, like I said, this Bardington instrument. These days, uh, you can get even more uh, sophisticated instruments. Uh, ours only has two magnetometers there, one in there and there. And this is one that uh, you can buy, eh, it's about six figures, <laughs> but um, this is, it collects even more data, even faster, it's on a cart. And even nowadays, you can get an instrument that uh, has a whole lot of magnetometers, it's pulled by a, a vehicle. And so you can just go back and forth really, really quick and collect huge amounts of data about an archeological site in a very short period of time, right? I wish I had one of those, but I don't, right? Um, again, those are six figure type things, right? So what, what you wind up with, I'll get rid of this thing here. I'm gonna admit somebody here. And then we'll get rid of this there so you can see a little bit better. Um, what you wind up with is a map that looks something like this. This is a map from a survey we did in Posey County uh, at a site called the Man Site. And um, what you see are just kind of anomalies beneath the soil, right? I think some people have the impression, um, you know, you think like, uh, remember the first scene in Jurassic Park, first Jurassic Park movie where they're like looking for the dinosaur and they're doing an excavation of the dinosaur. And then you use some kind of remote sensing thing and then it goes, the computer goes beep, beep, beep. And then you can see the in dinosaur, like, you know, with the individual bones of the dinosaur and everything, people kind of have the impression that these instruments are able to do that. It's not true. <laughs> Basically, what you wind up with are kind of suspicious blobs that you can test out, right? You know, that looks suspicious. Let's put a unit there, right? And then people ask me that question all the time, too. It's one of the major questions that I get from the public is, how did you know where to dig? Well, th these days, this is one of those methods that 
we use to know where to put excavation units, right? Um, so this was a particularly successful survey. We found amazing stuff at this site. The site dates to about 200 to 600 uh, AD. It's much earlier than Fort Biadnan, but we were able to find all sorts of interesting stuff. Oops, I got to click back on this to get it to go. There we go. All right, so this is the first uh, uh, set of data that we collected when we did our survey at Fort Biadnan back in 2009. Uh, basically, this thing right here with all of these blacks and whites, that's, that's the fort itself, right? Um, and then other things that we were able to see outside of the fort uh, were these circles. There were some kind of circular anomalies uh, that we thought were probably uh, Native American structures, right? So a lot of the excavation, in fact, the vast majority of the excavation in the fort in the 70s that, you know, uh, uh, MSU and IU did was in the fort. They were concentrated on that, learning about the residents and the traders within the fort, but not so much concerned with uh, some of the Native American uh, occupations. So that was part of the whole picture, right? It was the reason that the French were there in the first place was for trading purposes, right? The Native Americans would trade <laughs> first and they would give them stuff that they wanted, right? It's kind of this mutually beneficial sort of arrangement, right? So um, we wanted to look outside of this area as part of what, you know, more of what I was interested in doing, not so much in the fort, right? Um, and this is just a map of all the areas that we looked at over the years that we surveyed with the magnetometer. Here's the fort right down here, right? But we covered this huge area. These are some archeological sites in the area, but you can see we did magnetometry survey all over the place and found some spaces, uh, places where there are likely uh, significant, you know, intact deposits beneath the surface. This is just an interpretation of the, the data that we collected. Uh, these are the two uh, palisade lines of the fort that were identified during the excavations. There was an earlier one here and a later version of the fort here. Um, when I find, find can interpret, interpreted the data, what we found there was a kind of an oval arrangement of structures right here near the northwest corner of the fort, and then we had a couple of isolated ones out here. Um, and after uh, identifying those uh, probable structures, um, this is a kind of a close up. This is a close up of structures three and four here, and you can see there's a nice kind of ring shape anomaly in the data. Whoops, don't want to knock down the TV. <laughs> um, and so what we did then, oh yes, and, and this is a photo of um, a Kickapoo uh, house. So on this side of the river uh, were Kickapoo and Muscutin uh, folks, and on the other side was the, the Wea uh, living on the, on the other side of the river. Uh, this is a shot of, um, of a Kickapoo house, a traditional Kickapoo house. Uh, from, I think it's probably the late 19th century, I don't recall the exact date of the, of the photo, but you can see what it amounts to there is a sort of, um, it's basically uh, a framework of saplings, and then they would put like mats over the top or bark or sometimes even later with canvas if they could get a, a hold of that, right? So just kind of covering up that framework and that's what a traditional house looked like. So we were suspecting that these anomalies like this were probably houses, right? So what we did in 2013 is we put a block of uh, units over the corner of one of those houses, and there you go, boom. So we, we were able to locate it, you know, like I said, how do you find things? How do you know where to dig? There you go. We, could, we were able to put units right over the top of where we suspected a structure was located. We also located a long wall here uh, that wasn't picked up by the magnetometry. So like I said, it's not a magic wand. It doesn't see everything, but it does give you some clues as to where to dig. Right. So that was the structure that we excavated back in 2013. So this year, um, we want to go back and investigate some other areas outside of the fort. And one area that we uh, had found with the magnetometry is here. Uh, this is about 120 meters or you know, more or less 120 yards east of the fort, right? Um, and what we found here was a cluster, kind of a suspicious cluster of anomalies here. And we saw what we thought were probably or looked like walls like rectilinear uh, features there that were possibly walls. And if you flip it back and forth like this, you can kind of see what I'm talking about here. These are the possible walls. Um, and we were thinking, well, maybe this is like the, the earliest version of the fort. That is when the French first got there in 1717, we know 
that they didn't intend to stay, right? They were supposed to try to pers persuade the Wiyot to move away from this area and closer to Lake Michigan. The French didn't want them to be there. They wanted to be a little bit closer to their, you know, their, their home base, their sphere of influence where they could, you know, more convenient for them. But the Wiyot didn't want to move. They wanted to stay there. And so eventually the French said, okay, well, if you're not going to move, we're just going to build a proper fort in this spot. So we were thinking perhaps maybe this could be, you know, that very first occupation before they built the fort proper. Um, so, you know, we ought not 1.0 or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is just, I just went in and kind of drew where the anomalies were located. We had a cluster right here and these kind of rectilinear things that we suspected might be walls. Okay. So, and another sort of enticing sort of clue we had was uh, this is this is lidar data. This shows uh, micro variations in topography. Uh, this is the fort right here, the outline of the fort, more or less, right here. Um, and then there is a canoe cut right here. Basically, what it is is just kind of a, a V-shaped cut in this little berm right here. And we think that that's where they were loading and unloading the canoes, right? Now, this is a relic river channel and no longer the Wabash never flows, does not flow through here anymore. But we think that possibly during the time that the Atnam was occupied, this was the main channel of the river. And um, this would have been where they were unloading the, the canoes and then they'd carry the supplies up to the fort right here. Well, if you notice, there's another canoe cut over here, a smaller one. We thought, well, so maybe this spot over here where we're gonna be digging this is where the initial canoe cut was until they moved it over there and the fort was over there. Thanks. So keep it popping up. It's a floating meeting controls. Hide that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. So that was just kind of another reason to suspect that there might be something over there. Whoops. And that's what that canoe cut looks like. Um, you can see it's just kind of like a V-shaped cut in the, in the in the berm there. So we started digging over in that area where we suspected those things were. And here's some of the first days before the students knew what they were getting into, right? <laughs> so you got some students at the front here. Um, but uh, we, we set up the units and we opened up five uh, two by two meter units to investigate these, these areas. Um, and by the way, there's a whole lot of poison ivy out at the site. And I'll get this a whole lot of poison ivy at the site. And we did what we were supposed to, to do. You know that old saying, right? Leaves of three, dig it up and get it all over your arms. Well, we did just that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we did yeah. dig it up and we were smushing the roots through the screens and everybody got poison ivy. So that was fun. Right. Um, some some of us worse than others, right? Um okay. Okay, so here's the excavation a little bit farther along, and you can see that you know they're going a little bit deeper there. We've got five units kind of arranged. Oh, they are deep, <laughs> up to their waist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like somebody has <laughs> got their mute or has their mic on. Turn that off. Um, so there we go. We were digging uh, the, this area, and um, what we found was that. Um, we weren't finding a whole lot of fur trade era artifacts. You know, first week or so at field school, I'm laying awake in bed, like thinking, oh, where the hell are these artifacts? There was something funny, right? But we were, we were finding stuff, but it wasn't the, the right stuff, so to speak, right? Uh, but what we did encounter was what we call a midden in archaeology, <clears throat> which is a, a, a fancy word for a garbage dump, essentially, right? So you can see this soil right here. This is the, what we call the plow zone. This is the soil that's been churned up by the plow over the years, it's mixed up. It's artifacts are kind of churned around. And then you get down to below that and you've got some soil here that's not disturbed, right? Uh, that's where we start to find intact features and what have you. But you can see how dark it is down here. Um, this is the midden, this is the garbage dump, right? Now, what was in the midden, right? You know, if it's fur trade era, Midden, right? You expect to find fur trade artifacts, but we weren't finding them. There we go. All right. So what was in the midden? It was a whole lot of firecrack rock. Well, what's firecrack rock it is? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of rocks that are burnt and cracked into pieces. Now, what was this been used for? 
uh, cooking, probably, for cooking purposes. Certain cultures, certain time periods, the way that they cooked, <laughs> the way that they cooked was to, uh, um, you know, you dig a pit, you put a bunch of rocks in there, you heat them up with, you put wood in there and you put a bunch of rocks in there, you can cook things in there from the heat of the rocks. But what you wind up with is a lot of busted rock after that process, right? So we found a lot of firecrack gas. How many pounds was it? Does anybody remember? 180 pounds. 180 pounds total. <laughs> 3,000 pieces. I can look at it here. 3,000 pieces there, right? Uh, we found a lot of little animal bone piece fragments. So the remains of meals, a lot of mussel shells. So somebody was going down to the Wabash River and gathering mussels and breaking them open and, and, uh, and discarding the mussel shells in the midden. A little bit of chipped stone, so flaked material uh, from, from making stone tools. Uh, a couple of bone tools, bones that have been fashioned into tools. Oh, by the way, we, we have a bunch of artifacts that we found uh, this, this summer kind of on display here afterwards when I'm done talking. If anybody wants to come up and have a look at some of the things, you're welcome to do that. Yeah. So bone tools, uh, charcoal, uh, and a few pottery shirts. But these were all up in the plow zone, um, and they weren't uh, in the midden itself, right? So given what we were finding, I was thinking, okay, well, what is this? It probably doesn't date to the fur trade. In the absence of sherds, in the absence of pottery, told me it's probably archaic period, probably late archaic was my hunch. And then um, at the last, the last portion of the of the uh, the midden when we were excavating it, sure enough, we found a late archaic uh, little uh, dark point. Uh, it's a type of point called a Lamoka point. They're distributed across a large portion of the. Uh, Midwest and Northeast, um, and they date to about 3500, about 1500 BC, right? We found another one later, a little later on, another projectile point, and it is also late archaic. So um, I'm pretty sure it's late archaic, right? Not exactly what we were looking for. We found stuff, but it was the sort of stuff that we were hoping for, right? Um, so, you know, it was interesting in that regard that we were able to say something about uh, who was living there before Fort Weadnum was occupied. You know, this was a, a spot that people thought was a nice spot to hang out, um, but it wasn't fur trade era. What I think is happening, uh, we're in a little bit lower area. There was kind of a higher bit of a ridge up here and a little bit lower area where we were excavating. And I think probably the people were living up on the ridge there and just taking fire track rocks and food remains and stuff, just dumping it off the side of the ridge there a little bit. So that's what we were digging into. Um, here's a here's a here's another late archaic shell midden. This is an Indian knoll on the Green River in Kentucky. This is a this is what a, a real shell midden looks like. We're finding some shell, but this is a shell midden where there's just this shell up the wazoo. You know, this some of these sites, you know, you can get like a couple meters thick layers of shell, right? So this is a pretty common thing. Firecrack rock, uh, that's what it looks like, right? In all its glory. Right. Um, here's a bone tool that we found. We have that over there if you want to see it. It's ground down to a little bit of a point, like an awl for maybe poking holes and hides, that sort of thing. Um, this is an abrader. It's, it's just basically a piece of sandstone that you could use as sand, sandpaper. You want to sand things down. You want to make a bone tool. You can use that piece of sandstone to, to grind the bone, the bone into, a, into a point. Right. Um, here's a weird thing. This is kind of almost like an axe-like tool. It's ground on a number of edges, pecked on a number of edges. It kind of looks like an ax, but I'm not sure that that's what it was used for. Uh, I don't have a great name for this tool. Um, so basically these people uh, who are living up on this little ridge where, where Fort Weatnam was later built, were part of what we call the late archaic period. And who are these folks? These were hunter-gatherer peoples, right? Um, they, this, during this time, this is a time period where people were increasing, starting to settle down, right? They were hunter gatherers, but they weren't wandering all the way around in large areas to find the food that they needed. They were starting to settle down and live in one place for longer periods of time. Um, late archaic people were also dabbling in growing plants. Uh, there was a number of kind of weedy plants that they started growing. Um, and we don't know that the folks living there were doing this. I, I haven't analyze the data yet, but um, this is what later kayak folks were doing. And this is also the time when many of the mounds, the first mounds in this area were being built, right? Now we don't have any mounds uh, in the immediate area, but this is one of the things that later kayak folks were engaged in. All right, so we spent a couple of weeks on that and we said, okay, well, let's, let's try it again. 
I did want the students to get to do uh, some fur trade stuff, right? We've been talking about Port Riyadh on this, Port Riyadh on that, and then we did the late archaic mid, right? Um, so uh, I said, okay, let's find, we're going to find a shirt winner here. We're going to find a, <laughs> a spot where I can be virtually certain that we're going to find some artifacts related to the time period in question, right? So what I said is, okay, we've got all of these uh, structures out here. I've got this nice little isolated one. It was one of the biggest ones that we had uh, identified previously. And it was also the only one that was oval in shape. And then, uh, I thought, you know, maybe it might be interesting to put some excavation units in there and see what, uh, what that structure was all about. So we moved our shop over to there. This is what the magnetometry data looked like. You can see a nice little oval right here in the magnetometry data, which I was virtually certain it was a structure. Believe me, I was a little nervous, <laughs> right? After the first couple of weeks. Um, and there's where we put the excavation units um, over the structure. Uh, there was an excavation unit that was by Michigan State that was nearby, supposedly. Um, and um, so I wanted to avoid that. So we put kind of a, a U-shaped uh, excavation, uh, trying to avoid as much as possible that Michigan State unit. Um, and again, we only had two weeks left, and so I didn't want to bite off more than we could chew. Right? So I wanted to get everything done. Uh, in those two weeks. Um, there's that unit that I was talking about, the Michigan State unit that I was trying to avoid, test unit 36 that was done in 1979. All right, so here we go again. We're going to start all over again. We're going to uh, open up some units there, digging through the sod, which is the student's favorite part. Okay. Um, and here we are a little bit uh, farther along. Uh, we started finding fur trade stuff, which is good news, right? Um, but we're getting uh, it takes us quite a while, actually, to get through the, the plow zone, that top uppermost portion of the soil. Uh, we have to screen all that dirt and go through it and see if there's any artifacts in it. So that took a little while to do. All right, so that's better. We've started finding things that, I, that were related to the time period that we were hoping to find. Um, this is a side plate from a, a, a gun um, that uh, has been identified as French. Um, and it's, it's bent a little bit, so it's a little bit hard to see all the uh, engraved surface of the side plate. Um, but it's, it's about, from about 1740 or so, one of the trade guns that would have been traded to the Native Americans. I went, I got a little bit better photo there. You can see the engraving on there. It's all hand engraved. Um, and it's, there's where the side plate is on a gun. It's at opposite the, the lock mechanism, um, kind of holding everything in place and screws with a gun in there to kind of hold it all together. Um, this is a ramrod uh, pipe. So you think about these, you know, these, these guns would have had a ramrod to ram the ball and powder down to down the, the, the barrel. And then when you're done, you put the ramrod along these, these little metal guides uh, to put the ramrod back in place. And this was the one at the very bottom of the, of the gun. Of course, we'll find one of those. This is a, a, from a brown basset British uh, gun, just kind of showing where this would have been on the gun. And what it would have looked like before it got, you know, smushed. Um, gun flint, well worn, beat up gun flint. This is an English gun flint. Uh, they, these were made in England. They're kind of a dark gray color. Uh, so uh, this is a part of a knife blade, a French clasp knife. These are knives that were traded widely to the Native Americans. They're basically like pocket knives. Where you've got a wooden handle and the, and the blade folds out like this. Um, and then there's a little spot here. This is, I think, where the hole was to, to put it into the handle. And then there's a little piece of metal over here that kind of keeps it from, uh, uh, that kind of sets it in place when you open it. The other day when we gave a talk, uh, Leslie had brought out some, uh, some parts from other uh, We Have Not Excavations. So here's what a whole uh, blade looked like. And we were just getting, we just got kind of that part right there. And this is a side plate from a gun too. Um, so you just get that part. And here's what those clasp knives would have looked like uh, with the handle attached, right? So uh, we got a, a squished uh, hawk bell, uh, just basically a, a bell um, that would have been traded to, to the Native Americans. So one of the things that they liked were different decorative items, that kind of thing. We found a piece of silver. I don't have a photo of it, but we found a little piece of silver uh, in the excavations. Uh, this is a tinkling cone. This was found, what, yesterday? Yeah, yeah it's like 
ones. Okay. Well, this is just up to date stuff. I was putting photos in here like an hour before, <laughs> before the before the presentation because I wanted to show you all the things we were found. But this is a tinkling cone. It's it's basically a piece of scrap copper that the Native Americans would bend into a cone shape, and then they would attach them to clothing and bags and that kind of thing. And when they kind of struck together, they made kind of like tinkling noise. That's why they're called tinkling cones. Uh, and a lot of scrap copper, like just kind of mangled little bits and pieces of copper. Uh, a lot of these things would have been like uh, from uh, discarded kettles and that sort of thing. You got a kettle, and then when you use it enough, it gets a crack in it, it can't be repaired. And so what do you do? You cut it up into pieces and you just make stuff out of it. So then Native Americans were recycling these items all the time. Uh, this is a piece of uh, pottery. Uh, this is European made redware pottery with a lead glaze on the interior. You can see a little bit of the glaze there. This is probably, uh, if I were to guess, French. Um, but uh, it, it, typically the Native Americans weren't super interested in European pottery. You don't find a lot of European pottery in Native American fur trade era site. There are certain things they did like a lot. They loved those copper kettles. They like axes. They like cloth. They like beads, you know, all sorts of different things that they could kind of incorporate into their culture. Things like European made pottery, they were typically like, eh, you know, it doesn't fit into our way of doing things. We don't really want it. So, but we found a uh, shirt from a, from a large, thick vessel in there. A um, few nails uh, here and there. These are all hand wrought nails that are made by a blacksmith, individually made. What you would take the, the way that these were made was you had a rod of iron which you would cut into lengths, and they hit, the blacksmith had to individually hammer every nail, right? So you can imagine how long that took, right? Uh, but these are definitely hand wrought nails. They're in pretty good shape too, um, actually, because I think they were I think they, they were good shape because they were burned. For some reason, I don't know the exact reason, but burned nails tend to survive better than those that are not burned. But these are in really nice shape. This is a base of a bottle um, and it kind of looks iridescent and shiny. That's what happens when glass, when really old glass starts to break down, it gets, this, gets this iridescent surface and it almost doesn't even look like glass. Like some people, some students would come up like, what the heck is this? It's a piece of glass, right? It just looks like this weird shiny thing. If you hold it up to the sun, you can see through it. You can actually see the color of the glass, but the glass that we were finding inside of the structure was um, kind of a, uh, olive color, which is typical for like wine bottles of the 18th century, so definitely from that time period. This is a weird thing, kind of looks like a, uh, a thermometer. It's a tube of glass melted on the end, um, and but it kind of flares out at the top. I don't know what the heck it, it is. Uh, if anybody has any ideas, welcome to it. Uh, I found a few pipe stems uh, from, uh, from these long stemmed pipes. These are the type of pipes that the French and British would have been smoking. Um, so for some reason, we found a few of them in this Native American structure, which we, is not super common because they typically didn't uh, use these kinds of pipes. And then today, this is like just really like a few hours ago, we found this. This is the very last artifact we found <laughs> in the excavation. Um, we we're backfilling, putting all the dirt back in the holes, and we had a couple people who were um, making a profile map of the wall before we filled it all back in again. And then, um, <laughs> and then Cassie said to me, there's a rock in the profile wall, it has a hole in it. I'm like, hmm, what's that? So I walked over there and sure enough, I had a hole in it. And so I kind of carefully pried it out and there you go, it was quite right. So that was kind of a nice way to end everything up uh, with a really kind of cool artifact made out of pipe stone. This is a Native American made uh, pipe that would have had some kind of a stem attached to it for smoking. Uh, we also have evidence that they were chewing gum. <laughs> this is uh, was found in the plow zone. I don't know. Maybe it's just from Michigan State. I don't know who it was. But some, somebody was chewing fruit stick gum uh, back in the 70s, maybe. So this is what that excavation looked like. So I showed you a few of the artifacts, but this is what the uh, excavation looked like. Once we got below the plow zone, we encountered this dark soil here. Um, and one of the reasons I think that the structure was visible in the magnetometer is because it was burned, right? That's one of the things that the magnetometer can see is burned things, right? So we've got all this dark material from the interior of the structure. Over here is where the wall of the structure was. And we caught a portion of the wall. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. 
Um, and here's the excavation of the wall in progress. Basically, it came out of the, 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 the wall right here and kind of curves in this direction. We just didn't have enough time to do the whole thing or even a very large portion of it. Um, like I said, we only had a couple of weeks left. I didn't want to leave anything unexcavated. When I open up an area, I like to do everything and get it all done. And especially since I don't know 100% like when I'm going to be back, you know, you can see at the beginning, I was kind of, I'm here kind of intermittently and that sort of thing. So I'm not here every year. Uh, so I wanted to be able to finish everything up. But here's the students excavating that wall. Um, and it's, well, there's more excavation of the wall. Here, this kind of shows you what that soil looks like inside the wall trench. You can see all these black dots and everything. That's all like charcoal, bits of charcoal uh, from the burn structure. There was a lot of burned soil in there too. Uh, so it was a pretty hot, intense fire. It burned this, burned the soil, and then the whole thing just kind of collapsed. I think. Uh, here's some nice little drone shots we got the other day, um, and you can see the excavation in progress. Here's the wall that I was talking about it being excavated right there, and this is the interior of the structure. The, the entirety of the structure would have been like right around here, like this. Like I said, it was an oval, so we caught a portion of it there. Uh, here's another one, another aerial shot of us digging. Uh, and then just today, this afternoon, we um, filled the holes in, right? We got everything done, a little bit ahead of time. It's supposed to rain tomorrow anyways. Nobody wants to backfill holes in the rain, you know, <laughs> least of all me. Um, so we, we knocked it out and got all the holes filled back in. And that's the end of the field season, right? So... Just a little bit about what's next. What's the, the, the process of archaeology? I mean, everybody thinks about archaeology as digging, right? You know, when you think of archaeology, you think of people digging stuff up in the ground. Uh, but that's really just a very small portion of the whole process, right? The, the, the time you spend digging, you can expect to spend three or four times that amount with the rest of the, 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 the process. We've got to catalog everything. So everything that came out of the ground, we washed most of it. There's a few things that haven't been washed yet, but when it gets back, when I bring it back to USI, you have to catalog everything, dump out every single bag, sort through it. We've got fire crack rocks, we got scrap copper, we got this, we got that, we got animal bone, we sort it all out, count it, weigh it, and figure out what we have, right? I mean, how are you gonna figure out what's going on if you didn't even know what you have, right? That's the first step. Uh, one of the things we also have to do when we get back is process quotation samples. We took a lot of samples of soil from the, the archaic midden and from the structure itself. Essentially what I'm talking about is um, what we'll do is we'll, instead of most of the soil that comes out of the excavation goes through a screen. So you put it in the bucket, dump it in the screen, sort through it, pick out all the goodies, right? That kind of thing. In some instances, what we do is take the soil, we don't put it through the screen, we just stick it right in the bag, we bring it back to the lab. And so what we do then is we take the soil, we put it in water and all the floaty bits float up to the top. The charcoal, any burned seeds, plant material, anything like that will float up to the top. That's one of the ways that we can tell like what plants people are eating, right? If we got remains of this plant or that seeds and all that sort of thing, we can, we can skim those off the top of the, the, of the water and, and, and analyze them. I, I don't analyze that stuff. I send it off to somebody who can identify seeds. It's not my, not my area of, the, of expertise. But uh, we will do that and talk a little bit about maybe some plants that were recovered in the structure and in the midden, right? Um, I would like to get some carbon dates for the midden. So I do have some spear points, those little tiny guys there that kind of tell me a little bit about when that thing was occupied. But we, if we get a carbon date, uh, a C14 date or two, uh, we can nail that down a little bit, a little bit better, right? Just FYI, there's not much point in carbon dating the structure, the fur trade structure, because you can't nail it down to like an exact year or even an exact decade or anything like that. Carbon dating gives you a, a range of dates. You know, for the for the midden, it might give you a date that was something like you know 2250 BC to you know 1950 BC, you know, something like that. And it's not precise enough to nail down an exact decade for the structure that we found, right? But it'll be super useful for the midden, right? Uh, and then we sit down and we start to do the analysis. I got to put everything into a database so I can look up like how many, how much firecrack rock was found in unit G. I can type that in, boom, I'll have that available at my fingertips. And then I do 
you know, kind of compile all that information and write up something about it, right? The final thing that we have to do is write the report. Um, every time we do an excavation in, in, in Indiana, you have to have a permit, right? From the state to excavate. Um, Indiana is pretty tight in its laws about who can excavate and who can't, right? You have to be a qualified professional, you have to have a permit and all that kind of stuff. And one of the obligations I have once I get that permit is I have to write a report, which is submitted to the state. Um, and I share that stuff with people as I can. Um, and you know, finally, give talks like what I'm doing right now, write articles, give conference papers, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's in the future once we figure out what we've done. Just finished digging today, so we got a long road ahead of us. Um, so I'll leave you with this picture of a snapping turtle that was in the middle of the road. <laughs> that was trying to thwart our uh, uh, driving out to the site there. Um, so that's all I have. If anybody has any questions about the excavation, et cetera, I'd be glad to answer them. Yep. You can stop the route. Uh, this, is that a function of time or would you have liked to go on deeper if you had more time? Uh, yeah, people do ask me that a question all the time. How deep do you need to go? You go until there's the archeology span is done, right? So with the midden part, we dug through that. We got to the point where we were getting pretty much sterile soil and then you're done and you don't have to dig anymore. I mean, you do find situations where archeology span can be buried. I was digging at a site in Clark County where the archeology span was as deep as you know the ceiling from down there and we were still finding stuff, but that didn't happen to be that situation. It was just relatively shallow. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. The picture you showed there, I, I can't remember the name of, but you, to show you where to dig, mm -hmm. what was that called? The magnetometry data? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that from like a satellite or something? Oh, uh, well, I, I did. You talked about the LIDAR map. Well, you showed a picture and it had like a little grid on it. Oh, that? Um, I'm sure. The actual magnetometry instrument, I think. It might have been magnetometry <clears throat> data. Yeah, that's, that's. Um, it looked like pictures from the satellite. Ocean. Yeah, the one, that, the one I think you're talking about, it was, it's LIDAR data. It is from a satellite. Yeah, basically what the satellite does is it flies over the earth, it shoots the laser down at the ground and it laser bounces back and it records the precise elevation at that point. So it makes really super detailed maps of the elevation of all entire state. In fact, the LIDAR data for the state of Indiana is publicly available. So it's not is that how you, you knew what spots to dig? It helps, yeah. It's just part of the deciding where to dig is, is the LIDAR data. But the magnetometer is also a you know, useful in that's the one where we just walk back and forth, back and forth, and, and survey the ground with the, carrying the instrument like that. Yeah. Mike, I have a question from the Zoom audience. Um, when someone in the crowd asks a question, can you please repeat the question okay. so the Zoom audience knows what's being asked? All right, I'll do that. No Thank problem. you. Sure. Uh, what gave the you away that one of the ramps? Through the, the edge was older than another one. Oh, so the question was, is why, wh wh why did I think that one of the, the canoe cuts uh, was older than the other? I, I don't know which one's older. Um, it's, it was just kind of a trying to piece together some information and thought maybe this was the earlier one and that was where the first version of the fort was. And then this one was associated with the fort. I don't know for sure. But yeah, I don't have any direct evidence for that. It's just kind of a guess. Yes. Is 3500 BC, is mm -hmm. that as kind of old as you expect people to live in this area? Okay, the, the question was uh, when I said that 3500 BC, is that as the oldest sites that we have? Um, no, actually, uh, the oldest sites that we, we keep pushing the date back, it, it, that's not my area of expertise, but the earliest sites we have now are more than 15,000 years old. Yeah, so those are what we call Paleo Indian uh, cultures. Um, but, um, you know, back when I first learned this stuff, it was a lot more recent, but there's discovering sites that are older and older than that even. Yeah. Oh, it is a question of whether there were any paleo Indian sites in Indiana. I, you know, they do periodically find paleo Indian artifacts. I don't know off the top of my head of any excavations of paleo Indian sites in the state of Indiana. There are certain spots like on the plains where they're very, there's a lot of excavations of those kind of sites and up in like Alaska and those sorts of areas. But uh, we don't, 
there's not a whole lot of paleo Indian archaeology in, in Indiana that's, that's been done. There's something like 11 or 12,000, if I remember very specifically, but I don't remember where in the state that was supposed to have been found. Uh, in, in state of Indiana? I think so. Yeah, it may I'd be. I'd have to double check. I could be wrong. Yeah, no, it may be. It's not really my, my what forte. If, what if we switch to the show and tell and we can still mm -hmm. answer questions? Sure. Uh, well, people can. Can check things out, and mm -hmm. um, th that may get more difficult for uh, for the Zoom people to keep up with that. So I don't know what. Yeah. We, I'll check with Leslie about what we want to okay to do with that. Well, maybe we could just kind of shift over here if people want to look and have a, have a look at some of the artifacts that I just showed in the in the PowerPoint. We can do that. And there are a number of students who can also uh, address some questions. That's true. <laughs> yeah. They can come back behind the table there and talk. We will also be posting this video on the Tippecanoe County Historical Association's YouTube channel. In a couple days, it'll be posted. You'll also see these pictures, I'll get them from Dr. Mike, on the Feast of the Hunter's Moon Facebook group page. I'll post some of them. Okay, great. All right, I guess we'll just... Thanks. I don't know, I don't know, I'm a picture of this